All right. Excited to talk about FinTech. We've got uh, a few good topics to cover today. I'm excited to be here with you, Sikander. Uh, me too. For those of you who don't know, Lauren and I have worked together. I'm an operating uh, partner or venture advisor at A Crew, And in between my two jobs, uh, the place I parked myself was with A Crew um, and Lauren and her partner, Teresa Gao. So uh, we have been talking fintech for years <laughs> um, yeah. before, uh, uh, long before I took the zero job. Yeah. Um, I spend nearly all of my time investing in fintech. And so when Sukinder was working with us, I was excited as she started exploring opportunities in fintech, uh, going back to the beginning for you where you sort of started out early in your career. So. Yes, yes, at Yodely. For those of you who are in fintech now, um, that was one of my first startups. And uh, yeah, many, many years ago, but finally, uh, still, and finally instilled the backbone of a lot of fintech apps. So, Sukinder, let's let's have a chat. Uh, I am curious. We, you and I, have talked a lot about sort of the evolving fintech landscape over the last few years. Clearly, the sector, as you and I know, both know very well, took a pretty hard fall from from grace, probably more so than a lot of other sectors in tech. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, you know, some rebounding, but it's still slower than some of the other, you know, leading tech sectors and. I'm curious, what is your latest sentiment as you think about the market? Sure, and maybe what I'll do is I'll cover a little bit about what's going on later. I mean, because I'm running Zero, and for those of you who don't know, Zero is basically financial software to do your accounting for small businesses around the world, um, including in the US. But I feel like I see later stage. I do see some early stage startups, but I feel like you can probably cover what's going on early stage, yep. and I'll just talk about what I see late stage. So first of all, you know, for a company like Zero, obviously, we power a lot of fintech apps. So I get to see kind of where sentiment is and sort of what, what's hot and what's not through the lens of what's getting used at zero. Um, you know, one of the things I think or areas of, uh, I would say, uh, believe it or not, a highlight is probably compliance tech. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what compliance tech is, it's really the area of fintech that deals with everything from KYC to how you file your taxes, um, to how you make payments or do e-invoicing. And it's really simple to tell you why. Number one, the burden on companies early to late stage um, to public to um, do more and more compliance in everything from payroll to tax has never been higher and the trend line is only up. Secondly, around the world, governments are basically trying to collect more money digitally. And so they turn to startups and start to put in place regulation. And the US is maybe the anomaly here actually, but in most markets around the world, you know, governments are seeking to collect their own money faster and to put in more and more compliance obligations on businesses. And so as a result, that sector, I would think, is, is like, I see it as pretty hot yeah. and kind of increasing. Um, so that's one of kind of, I would say, uh, the high points. The second one, and this is obvious to all of you, payments in everything. I mean, payments in everything. So at Zero, we're a horizontal platform. We, of course, are inserting payments in our workflow because it makes sense. If we're going to help you create an invoice, why not get it paid on Zero, right? Of course. Um, if you're going to create create a bill, why don't we help you pay that on zero? So it's very, it's very congruent with accounting software. But in our app store, I would just say it's all vertical, vertical software plus payments. And so you, of course, see the backward integration of fintech into pretty much every vertical out there. So those are the two things that stand out that I see. But what about you? So I guess taking a step back, I would say, you know, I asked the question in a skeptical way because it's sort of the, the sentiment in the market. But as you know, I continue to be really bullish on fintech. I think that this is actually a really interesting time for early stage companies to be starting. Um, if you think about the first major wave of fintechs, like the big cohort that sort of came about in the early 2010s, mm -hmm. Um, you know, they were really driven by a few things. One, they were sort of in the wake of a big macroeconomic uh, decline with the GFC, uh, sort of coming out of that. Uh, there was a huge demographic shift with millennials as sort of the first generation of quasi-digital natives coming of age, entering the workforce, setting up their financial stacks for the first time. And then, um, uh, and then mobile was becoming ubiquitous as sort of this technology shift. And if you think about it, there are a lot of parallels happening right now. So, you know, clearly we've, we're sort of in the midst coming out of a period of macroeconomic volatility. 
we uh, are seeing a big uh, tech shift with AI, and then there's some major demographic shift happening, Gen Z coming of age. We're about to hit on a $70 trillion wealth transfer in this country. You know, and just sort of the global interconnectivity of the world, you know, accelerated by COVID with more global migration, global work. Um, so, uh, so on a high level, like I'm very bullish about this being a great time for new fintech companies to be built. Um, there are a lot of things that I think are interesting. We'll talk about AI in a minute, but one of the themes specifically that's kind of top of mind for me is it's, it's very global. So cross-border payments has been something we've been spending a lot of time on, as you know. Yep. You know, obviously there are a lot of companies out there in the space, but the reality is many of them have built interesting UIs on top of existing rails. Many of them uh, even operating on top of Swift still, which was, yes. you know, the messaging system built in the 1970s. It's like a bad game of phone tag. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, we think there's opportunity to really rebuild uh, and create new rails, especially deep into new into corridors that have been sort of less developed, so Africa being an example. And so we're spending a lot of time thinking about that and the opportunities around that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, certainly we see cross-border payments also still as a pain point. Interestingly, when we go to do payments in or payments out, still the majority of the players we work with are very central to a country. Uh, but no doubt, it's also one of the places you can make money in payments, yeah. um, which, you know, I think is maybe the other topic uh, worth covering, which is just what's happening in business models. Yep. Um, so, you know, if you kind of were to think about not just what's hot, but also business models, I think I talked previously about payments in everything, but the, you know, one of the things that I appreciate actually about Zero, one of the reasons I chose to go to Zero, is because um, many people think of fintech as kind of a transactional product, and in fact, payments is, right? But of course, like anything, the most highly valued companies have like loyalty and a recurring business model. And so, you know, I thinking I think as you all set up companies, particularly in fintech, thinking about how you get to a subscription stream as well as a payment stream is maybe one of the most important choices to make early on. How you price your products. Um, so at Zero, obviously, we are almost entirely subscription-based, and that makes sense for us because we provide what accounting software. So we're really a SaaS company, right? But happen that happens to be in fintech, and we would love nothing more than the upside of transactions. So payments is a big push for us because it adds variability to our business model. The converse is also true. I see a lot of payments companies that have realized that they built software and workflow for people, and they just gave it away to get the payment. But payments is a hard business. I mean, it's the essence of fintech. It's one of the big verticals, but it's a hard business, right? Unless you have a lot of recurrence of payments. Like if, like if you're Bill.com, you have a lot of payments flowing through you, right? If you're a Square or, you know, uh, uh, PayPal, of course, your merchants have a lot of flow. They do all of their business potentially uh, using you as a platform. But for the vast majority, payments alone is not enough. So thinking about if you're building software, can you think about a dual business model? Can you kind of, I would say, calm the volatility of payments with adding a subscription stream to the workflow? Typically, people will give away the workflow as uh, to lock in. But I think a lot of people are waking up and realizing, like, man, like we wish we had that dual business model. Yeah. It's so interesting because uh, one of the things that I love about fintech is I think that there's unique opportunity for business model innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I get really excited when I see companies that are thinking differently um, about, about how to make money. And, um, you know, but as I think about the last few years, one of the things that I know, you know, we've talked about quite a bit is that, you know, in the sort of peak of 2020 and 2021, there were a bunch of, you know, models that came about where companies created some interesting hook, could be a B2C, B2B, but an uh, interesting hook to acquire cheaply with the idea that they were going to upsell to a business model that drove their margins. And that just hasn't worked. I think there are like a l tons of zombie companies out there, unfortunately, that are still trying to figure out what that primary business model is going to be. And if you think about the fintechs that have reached real scale over time, most of them had from pretty much day one, the business model that really drove them to scale, right? I mean, they, they have since launched other things, but, um, but to me, you know, as I look at companies now, the most important thing is that the, the, you know, out the gates, they have a business model that works. 
Well, I'm chuckling because Lauren and I obviously prepped for this panel. And one thing she said is like, there's an era where CAC was the business model. Yep. Yep. CAC was the business model. I'm like, no, no, that's not a business model, but that's a method of acquiring. And I think the reason is because, again, markets go through shifts, and we all lived through an area, you know, I was in e-commerce at the time with StubHub. Um, you certainly lived many eras, you know, of looking at companies across different verticals. I think that's because for the longest time, like, you know, customer acquisition was the problem to solve. So then everybody became single-minded on how to solve the CAC problem, right? And so it led to a burst of companies getting funded, but maybe this brings full circle the relationship between business model and sentiment, which is like, look, you can have a great hook to acquire, but you will get funding based on, you know, having a business model as between CAC and LTV that works. Yep. And that may seem very obvious, but it's important. It's the difference between building a feature and a company. Absolutely. Um, and obviously now to try and get public, I think one can say, like, at least today, to try and get liquidity in the public markets, that model needs to be pretty close to profitability. Yep. Or gross margin positive. Yes. Is that right? I mean, yeah, uh, trending towards profitability. For I mean, and certainly gross margin, you know, a positive even that looks more like SaaS. I mean, that's what, if you want to get a fintech multiple, yeah. you need to look like a tech company, you know, yes. otherwise you're going to get a traditional yeah, you're finance. Gonna get, yeah. Yeah. Or, e yeah, or even an e-commerce multiple, which is a tough multiple, yep. yet if it's all transactional. Yep. Um, so anyway, for all of you thinking right now in your early stages about how to build your business model, I think um, it may be, you know, a time in the cycle where having both good CAC economics, but not just pushing CAC economics to be the lowest if you can't start to solve LTV is going to be, you know, is going to be a, an inhibitor. Do you think it's an inhibitor of raising a series A, B, C? I'm curious. Like, I think at this point, you need to know the business model that is going to get you to strong gross margins out the gate. It doesn't mean that you need to have extremely strong gross margins from day one. I mean, the reality is, like, in payments, that rarely happens, yeah. right? But but people understand the payment model and that yes. you get to scale, your margins improve. And so as long as you can show a clear path to getting there, mm -hmm. I think people are still willing to underwrite that. What they're not willing to underwrite is, you know, an unproven model that doesn't make sense where, again, it relies on you, you know, getting to the customer and then upselling to something, to something else. Um, but I would say, you know, in, on a positive note, these, this period of macroeconomic volatility that we've gone through also opens up opportunities for new business models. I mean, if I think about even, you know, Chime, where, as you know, I led a, a Series A back in 2016, um, it wasn't fundamental business model innovation that drove them, but they recognized coming out of the financial crisis that, uh, you know, there was new regulation in Durban, and uh, that really enabled them to differentiate and monetize on debit interchange in a way that really hadn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm sure, there are more creative people in this room than me that can figure this out, but there are going to be opportunities like that coming out of this period to start to think about things, things differently. Well, one other thing Chime did, and I know we have, we're going to shift to another topic, but yep. one other thing I found interesting about Chime that it did, and I think this is, this is important in fintech, it's very obvious, but it's like, start with a customer segment that is big enough that you want to win. Yep. So in the case of Chime, I believe that was this younger customer demographic where the shift to banking was they had no loyalty yep. to the traditional banks. Um, you figure it out, I think, you tell me, like payroll was part of it, right? How to get people paid and their paychecks. Yep. But it was really like understanding that customer, what was going on and how to get their direct deposit, and then the use of the debit card. Is that is that right? Yeah, so they, I think from, from day one, they were serving sort of mass market, Americans, 70% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, but you're right, they were millennials newly entering the workforce, yeah. setting up their financial stacks for the first time, and yes, you know payroll as well as anyone, but the, the reality was that they were, you know, really oriented around how do we get these customers not just in the door and not just funded, to direct deposit. Yeah, that, that was the key. Yeah, because I saw behavior. a lot of fintechs yep. in that period where like there was a lot of new banks, digital yep. banks. And I'm like, the key is like, how do you get people to deposit the paycheck with you? And, and Chime cracked that, but it backs up. I'm, you know, I, Lauren and I made an investment in a company called Snap Commerce, which is up in Camden doing really well and started with, believe it or not, a messaging app for travel. But what they noticed, and this has been the most interesting thing when you look at business models, and I know we need to switch to AI, Snap was basically doing 
doing messaging to book hotel rooms at a discount. Yep. Okay. Then they started doing goods. And then they noticed that the people, uh, this is what I mean about, you know, everybody becoming a fintech. Then they noticed that the people who were buying hotel rooms were using their debit cards. Then they noticed that they were really big on the discount. Then they understood that the customer they had was a debit card customer who was younger. Then they created a super card. They, um, and, and now they have a super subscription where it is a fintech company and an e-commerce company where they understand that core demographic that is not flush with cash, that cares about the discount on the hotel and what have you, and that also uh, would love access to ongoing discounts and a card. And you know now super has a subscription business in addition to a payments business and e-commerce business. That's an example of knowing your customer and like how to use these business models once you know who that customer is. Yep, it's a great example um, and a really exciting company. All right, Sikander, this would not be a 2024 tech conference if we didn't <laughs> talk about AI. So We're going to talk about it. Yep, we're going to talk about, about AI. It. And, and Zero's doing some interesting stuff. So tell me, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, sure. So, of course, like everyone, you know, the way we think about AI is how to make life easier for our customers. There's a lot of hype about AI right now. So I also just ground everyone in the true fact that a lot of AI has been happening for many years. It's called machine learning, <laughs> you know, and that's true. But of course, companies like Zero that have a lot of customer data have the ability to take advantage of LLMs, uh, whether they're our own or somebody else's. What we really care about is having the data set that makes those LLMs really accurate and sing. And we are thinking about how to really just contextually provide better experiences to our customer base. And there are two or three ways that are obvious, so let me just say them. Number one, everybody has AI, Gen AI, working in their customer support models. We have it too. We've seen a huge increase in, uh, not a huge, significant increase in productivity right after launching it in terms of the number of search queries that went down and even the number of people we have to staff in customer service. It's very obvious. Um, some of the other obvious places, insights and analytics, Again, if you have good structured data, very well suited to things like cash flow forecasting and so on. Now, the more fun stuff, a bit about a month ago, we announced Jax. Jax is just ask zero, um, which is our AI agent. And as our chief product officer would say, all of the different LLMs and, and um, workflows you're trying to hack all have what's called AI agents. Okay, an AI agent, if people use, use this nifty term, I was like, really, are these all AI agents? <laughs> In, to, in truth, they are. Think about an LLM, you know, apply to a set of specific tasks and, you know, the AI, the ta workflow that does is called an AI agent. Um, so we're thinking about using our AI agents in analytics, obvious. Um, the less obvious use cases that we announced it um, uh, recently are really taking them outside of the Zero app and starting to put jacks in email, um, in WhatsApp, on text, because we believe that customer really wants um, to have mobile be an e easier experience for fintech. Being able to serve a small business wherever they are, a lot of work happens in email, a lot of work happens on text. So really, Jax is, even in its early evolution, uh, an AI agent you can call upon simply by emailing them, emailing it <laughs> or texting it um, and really having it return you things like a newly created invoice, an invoice embedded in email that just fires off on your behalf. So as you are kind of moving around the world, doing the things you do as a startup founder, as a small business, that Jax really travels with you. So early on, one of the things we want to differentiate is we believe a lot of the way AI will transform how we work is by bring, having it in the surfaces you work on, not just embedded in your app. So cool, and and you know you obviously came into zero fairly recently and really sort of picked up the uh, baton on this stuff. So it's it's been fun to watch you know the the work that you've been doing in this space. And it's interesting. I, I didn't even share this with you in our prep because we just kind of finished it. But at Acru we did an analysis of about 35 late stage um, sort of pre-public fintechs and then public. Uh, companies to sort of see what people are announcing that they're doing in AI, what are the mm -hmm. strategies, and, you know, uh, about of, of those, 80% had, had announced something, all, all had hinted at, at, at using AI, 80% had specific strategies. Um, of those, you know, certainly everyone seemed to be using for internal purposes, be it yes. customer support, that was like 50%. Marketing. Marketing. Yeah. Engineering productivity. Yeah. yeah. Fraud is another big one, especially among payments companies yes. and networks. Um, but what I was really interested in is the, is the folks that are using it, like Zero, mm -hmm. in their products, right? So much more customer facing. Um, and uh, and I don't know if you'll like this or hate this, but actually, <laughs> the, the 
group that was most active uh, in embedding AI in their products were companies like including zero, but sort of serving the, the CFO or the finance yes, stack. Yes, function. So seven, of, seven of eight of them, of that group, uh, had announced strategies sort of embedding uh, AI in the product. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and I'm not surprised because we are squarely, look, we deal with startups like you all and uh, non-tech small businesses. I mean, there is no CFO. The CEO is the CFO. Um, uh, and many of them work with accountants and bookkeepers, so they have some fractional help, right? Uh, but there is no doubt that for them, all they want is the financial task to be easier so they can spend more time on the business. Pretty simple. Yep, makes makes so much sense. So, um, well, thank you for having the chat. I'm sure we could keep going for a long time, but uh, we will hand the stage over. And um, yeah, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, and always fun to do this with you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.